Uh, good morning and thank you for joining us today on a Saturday here on the panel. We have uh, footage from uh, 100MS, Sean from Twitch uh, and Building Pine and Lakshman, our moderator today from Never Install and Danush, our right hand of Serio Talk from Startup Grind. And thank you all of thank all of you for joining us today. We have about 65 people. So just a minute to just brief on CDO Talk. CDO Talk is um, India's uh, almost about first knowledge sharing platform for and by CDOs. What we do is we host discussions and produce resources around the topics of tech, engineering, and by uh, really talented CDOs uh, for the community. So CTO Talk today has evolved into a strong community of aspiring technology leaders from India's leading organizations. And we have monthly deep dive discussions. We do have a blog and a LinkedIn page to stay connected right now. So um, without further ado, uh, I'm going to take uh, honor of uh, introducing our moderator today, uh, Lakshman. Lakshman is, a, is the co-founder of Never Install. And uh, Never Install is also developed by using WebRTC. And he's been building a cloud platform that allows you to run any application from the browser without installing it at all. So Lakshman, over to you for introductions of the speakers and the session, please. Thanks, Shweta, for that. Uh, good morning, guys. Uh, so happy to see you over 65 folks joining us on Saturday. Um, I won't take up much time. I wanted it to be about Sean Shitit. So a quick uh, introduction about Sean. Sean's got one of the best projects out there on GitHub with over 8,000 stars uh, and one of the best implementations of WebRTC in Go. Uh, Shitej, 100MS, us, and a couple of other really good products have been using Pine at the code and building really cool products. Then we have uh, uh, Shitej. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Shitish is the CEO, co-founder at uh, 100MS. He's been working with uh, video for over 20 years. Uh, prior to 100MS, he was a VP at Hotstar, and prior to that, at, uh, he was at Facebook. Uh, one of the cool things about uh, his work at uh, Hotstar is the uh, concurrency number that we guys uh, watch whenever we are watching IPL. Right, so he was instrumental with that. So over to you guys. Sean, you want to get started? Sean, would would love to hear a little bit about you again, maybe one more time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Sean. Yeah, so the project that I've been working on is called uh, Pion. And it's a bunch of Go implementations of popular software needed to build real-time communication. And we'll go more into detail on what WebRTC is, so don't worry if you know don't know what it is yet, but um, it's kind of the technology that's making all of the most interesting things, you know, interactive experiences, robotics, um, you know, products that allow you to stream your games remotely. And um, and that's kind of what I'm passionate about. And so I went and wrote this implementation of, of Go, implementation in Go, and then now I've been working on this book called WebRTC for the Curious, and it's completely open source. You can just Google it, and um, it's about like how WebRTC works, and um, goes into like the deep details. If you like, if you really want to know, not just about using the APIs, but about how like the actual protocols on the wire work. And uh, I'm super excited to be here, and um, I hope you fire me lots of questions. I, I love talking about this stuff, and if um, you're uncomfortable reaching out now, I'm available. Um, I have a, a lot of presence online on Twitter and and uh, go for Slack. So please, like, reach out anytime. Thank you, Sean. That was amazing. <laughs> By the way, I mean, Sean is an inspiration. So uh, thanks a lot, Sean, for joining us today. Um, a little bit about me, guys. I'm uh, uh, like Sean is uh, passionate about video. I mean, similarly, I'm also very, very passionate about video. I've been uh, kind of working in video for the last 20 years now and been changing jobs or startups around video. <laughs> so I mean, when I, when I started my career, like uh, 20 years back, I was working on chips, uh, uh, which enabled video. Uh, like I used to work for Texas and 
um then i was working in video for like 3g uh, networks and the first iphones um and that time video was hard guys i mean trust me <laughs> it wasn't easy to uh, get video working at that time and then i kind of uh, went to U- us uh, joined facebook and uh, at facebook uh, was working on this um new product called facebook live and uh, facebook live was uh, i would say one of the key uh, one of the uh, starting um one of the one of the one of the most important projects which kind of started this whole uh, live video revolution right and that product grew like 20% uh, uh, week over week and saw that amazing growth um i came back to india uh, three years back and joined this company called uh, hotstar which is now disney plus hotstar and uh, their uh, the amazing team at uh, hotstar kind of built a platform uh, which is which is now uh, like giving i would say competition to netflix in india i mean uh, 25 million concurrency being part of disney i mean it's it's a pretty amazing tech which has been built at hotstar around it uh, thank you and and so so glad to be here uh, talking with you guys so just a uh, i mean uh, i'll i'll tell you a like a very high level uh, kind of a more 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 like a market outlook right uh, that what we think is like uh, the next 5 years or even 10 years every application will have video embedded right and more specifically it might have live video embedded so be it like what we are doing right now uh, has a live video embedded right um clubhouse did not exist like um, one year back right and now all the education the health the online gaming right so what 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 we feel is like every human interaction possible which was happening uh, uh physically the pandemic has kind of shown us that this can be done virtually also um and and it's a it's a it's a big kind of thing which is which is happening right now uh what i want to uh, talk about or like uh, i i know there are a lot of a uh, lot of product managers uh, here and engineers here um i want to kind of present a landscape of how to think right when you are building uh, live interactive apps and uh, i want to introduce some terminology um, uh, like the terminology we use is like there are three circles of interactivity circle 1 think of circle one being on the field so i i took an example of a game right like a, a soccer game so being on the field like the team uh, call the, that team as circle one because they are interacting with them in a bidirectional way and and the least latency possible uh, think of circle two being you being in the stadium uh, so if you are in the stadium you are kind of a one way observer but you can still shout and you can kind of uh, show your interactivity to the team uh, right so you are uh it's not that the the circle one cannot uh feel your presence circle one can feel your presence right uh, that is what i i call it as circle two uh and there is circle three which is more like passive not passive i would say it is live so it is it is active viewing but think of viewing it from your home now right so the circle one and circle two cannot kind of feel your presence and it is okay for circle 3 to be at a higher latency right so think of it this way now in technical terms right circle 1 on the field lowest latency possible interaction circle 2 it is okay to have a little bit of more latency uh, it's it's uh, it's 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 like one way however uh, you can jump from circle 2 to circle 1 i mean i people 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 do go for like ceremony and what not or um, somebody can uh, from the from the stadium uh, people go run over the <laughs> the field right so and circle 3 is like uh, you can have larger latency and um, and uh, and the interactivity kind of goes down right i'm showing uh, the the popular live video applications uh, which are kind of uh, very popular right now so circle one example is the google meet and zoom where there are there are roughly around hundreds of people and uh, they are kind of talking to each other in the lowest latency possible right so that is mostly teams um, stand ups right um, that is what we call it as circle 1 right um, 
then i'm coming to circle 3 now uh, circle 3 is another popular one uh, and this is what like the facebook live and disney hotstar built is the streaming right where we are saying you could have 15 to 25 seconds of latency um and you are streaming to these audience and this is like the circle 3 which is at at home circle right and there is a new uh, format which is appearing by the way which which we are doing it right now also like i would say air meet is also in the same ca category um where where there is circle there is a combination of circle 1 and circle 2 and let me so right now me shaun lakshman shweta we are on circle 1 right and all of the viewers uh, all of the uh, amazing viewers uh, as of now you are in circle 2 and you are at a very low latency like you are you are only 1 second far from us um there is a there is a uh, trade off uh, which needs to be made uh, between these circles right so circle 1 approximately can accommodate like 100 host maybe i mean maybe it will go to 1000 but like it, it it's it's in the range of hundreds right um the the circle 1 the circle 2 is uh, is in the range of 10000s right uh, i mean that is why let's say clubhouse has a limit of 10000 right now right like uh, it, it obviously it can go up but there is there is still a range uh, uh, and will come to why why this range right and then the circle 3 is the is the ma massive audience right like um, uh, where i mean uh i i know sean sean uh, dubois is much much popular than me but let's say even even let's say if if elon musk was here today with us then we would have needed the circle 3 <laughs> right now me and sean uh, and, uh like uh, obviously sean is more popular than me but like we we have around the 200 people in the in the circle 2 but if elon musk joins or mr modi joins then we would definitely need the circle 3 here um uh, and then that circle 3 will not accommodate within the constraints of the current platform right since i asked like uh, want to make it interactive uh, i want to ask you guys right like uh, uh, the the audience here if you have any questions around these circles right or if you want to uh, kind of uh, like I, i'm just putting up a poll here right uh like which which circle of interactivity would you want in your video app right and i can kind of explain again circle 1 is few hundred users um uh, by directional interactivity right less than 2 to millisecond latency circle 2 is uh things like what clubhouse does or what we are doing right now right and circle 3 is where you are really really scaling up uh, and you need uh millions of users right and you can say I, I, we can have a combination of these two also or three also so i'll just pause a few for a few seconds to take any questions also if there are any questions So there is a raised hand. Uh, Shweta, should we bring Nikhil to the to the? Uh, sure. One second. Yep. I think yeah. Yeah. Um. Am I audible? Am I on yes, the? Yes. Yes. Nikhil, you're okay. Right. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, Shweta, Shweta, for allowing me to be on the stage. Uh, so I, I don't come from a technical background, so my question is very simple. You know, even in the circle three, which is you know mass audience, uh, you might have some use cases where you still need to have very low latency, especially in the cases of like sports, right? Uh, sports streaming. Uh, sometimes that you have comments at the bottom of the live stream, say cricket, and you can't notice uh, Virat Kohli hitting a six five seconds later, post the comments come at the bottom. right so it kind of spoils the fun for audience when they you know are also looking at the comments and they're watching the video so 
you know, is there a trade-off there? Like you have circle three where you have constraints probably uh, in terms of how lower you can take the latency or is there a tech around which can sort of achieve ultra low latency even, you know, in those kind of large scale one side live streaming? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll try to give an answer and then Sean can I add on to this. Basically. <laughs> so, I mean, um, the reason why Circle 3 uh, has latency uh, is because it's not using WebRTC in my representation. It is using uh, something called uh, live streaming, which is like HLS and Dash protocols. And in HLS and Dash, the reason HLS and Dash protocols are able to scale this much is because they use CDN. Uh, unfortunately for WebRTC, I mean, uh, there is there is no concept of CDN as such right now. I mean, future, yes, there will be CDNs, but as of now, there are no CDNs. I mean, uh, uh, so the best way to scale at such a massive uh, audience is using HLS and Dash. And the best latency so far, I think, in production, uh, Twitch has been able to achieve, which is uh, five seconds. Uh, and uh, Sean, would you want to add something here? Yeah, um, I think, and it's it's because there hasn't really been like this whole idea of like massive interactivity is such a brand new, like there hasn't been a lot of demand is what I've seen. So like only in the past year have I seen people really say like, okay, I want to do something massively scalable with WebRTC. So, um, so yeah, I, I hope that like millions of users like will get to that, you know, 250 milliseconds of latency when the technology is there. And um, my hope is that it's with WebRTC, but there's even other, there's other things like web transport and um, which is over quick. So I guess the thing is like, it's like people are actively attacking it, but it's like, we're at this little sliver in time where this is such an exciting and young field still. Um, it's kind of amazing. You know, even though we all depend on WebRTC and stuff like that, this is, we're still like, it's like we're in the early days of web development still when it comes to WebRTC. That's kind of my take on it. Yeah. And Nikhil, I can, I can explain it from a more uh, example point of view, right? Like buying a stadium ticket is expensive, right? While watching right. it on TV is uh, less expensive. So you can actually take that example also that uh, if you are watching on TV, you are delayed, right? And there is a cost equation right now. The CDNs are cheaper. So CDNs, that is why CDNs are kind of equivalent to uh, watching it on TV. While if you want to watch it in stadium, I mean, it's not as expensive <laughs> as a ticket to stadium, but it is a little bit more expensive, right? So when, when people are ready to pay that cost, I am pretty sure that CDNs will be built on WebRTC. And uh, so I think it's it's more of a uh, more of a uh, consumer game. Like, are consumers ready to pay for that? Got it. Got it. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. I mean, this was this was fun. I think. I mean, uh, I hope the the concept of circles. Uh, I mean, we can we can keep talking about it, but I think. Uh, the, um, and, now, and I want to uh, give it over to Sean. And Sean, if you want me to keep driving the slides, I can do it. Or if you want to do it, you can do it yourself. Yeah, yeah, we can. Um, you can keep driving the slides. So, um, so now, like, I think we're going to do a deep dive on what WebRTC is and um, like a one particular subject about it. And I know that there's. Um, and my goal isn't to prove that, you know, to dive so deep that everyone gets lost and it's not interesting anymore. I think what I like to think about is there's so many interesting product things out there that can be built that a lot of these concepts don't even apply to video. So when we talk about, you know, real-time communication and peer-to-peer -peer and all these routing things, um, you know, I, I see people that are doing stuff with um, just sending, you um, data you know back and forth you know protobufs or JSONs or stuff like that like there's no reason that this has to be um just applied to webrtc so i want to share some cool concepts and you can kind of frame them into what you're building so webrtc is it's kind of an overloaded term it's both a protocol and an api for browsers and what a protocol is is like the actual messages that go over the wire so think tcp or json or HTTP, like these are all like things that actually get carried over the internet. And then an API is what like a developer would actually use in their IDE. And WebRTC, people find WebRTC confusing because it's a term that actually means two things. It's WebRTC is both what we send over the internet 
And then WebRTC is how we send things over the internet. So it's kind of confusing, but um, but that's kind of cleared up because you'll hear that you'll hear WebRTC used in both ways. And the first point is why WebRTC is most exciting for me or what kind of made me fall in love with it. It's end-to-end -end secure connection between peers. So what that means is when you have a when you have a WebRTC connection with someone else, it is always um, encrypted, and those and the two peers are the only people that have the keys. And what's really exciting about that is you can set up a WebRTC call where me and you can be in completely different networks, and we're talking to each other, and you have no idea, and you know an attacker has no idea what it means. And the other thing is we actually don't need to use a central server if it's just a one-to-one -one call. Um, and that's exciting, you know, if you're scaling, if you're like scaling a product or you want to have, you don't want to use as much bandwidth, but then it also gives you the flexibility to do things like, um, you know, circle three. So let's say I, you know, need to send my video up and then I can build like really flexible things to do what I need. So that's, I think that's like the first big part. The other thing with WebRTC is it's multiple audio and video tracks. So as you can see right now, you know, you're, you're looking at four, four or five videos on the side. You're looking at a, at a screen share. Um, WebRTC is incredibly flexible with that. So, and then also these aren't, there's nothing about these video feeds that says they have to come from a web browser. You know, I could add a video feed of a, of a car. I could add a video feed of, you know, like a screen capture from a, another device. And then you, it allows text and binary data. And this is where I'm seeing a lot of interesting things happen with WebRTC. Because it's not just about like, how do I get video around, but how do I get binary data? So I'm seeing um, a really popular one, or one that interested me is Tor, has this project called Snowflake, where they allow you to send, um, it allows you to do a, like a, um, a VPN over this WebRTC connection. So that means that two browsers can connect to each other and they can send data back and forth. Well, I could connect to someone else that's like in a different country that doesn't have access to a website and I can send it to them over data channels. And then it's unblockable because how do you distinguish WebRTC traffic that's in a video conference or WebRTC traffic that's helping circumvent, you know, firewalls and things like that. So that's, that's really exciting to me. Um, and then uh, next slide. And then more. So, you know, we kind of hinted at that WebRTC is in the browser, but in the past couple of years, WebRTC went from this just browser to browser technology where that's kind of how it started out. You know, we would build it in the browser and there's a couple servers to it kind of exploded um, a little bit because of COVID, but it was happening even before then. So now we have WebRTC implementations in Python, in TypeScript, in Go, in C++, in Rust. Um, so even if, you know, Go isn't your thing, you know, there's many, many other places you can do it. And I think that's really exciting. Like it's kind of becoming this um, very like, where if you're a developer in any language, you can go build something with WebRTC. It used to be if you wanted to do something with RTMP, um, you had to go do in C and C++ because there was only like one popular implementation. And what's really exciting is with WebRTC, you're able to do on a bunch of different platforms. And, um, you know, if 100 milliseconds, you know, you'll see that this isn't just something that's for um, like browsers or conferences, but you'll see like people like uploading security camera footage, or you'll see, um, you know, the live sports events, like those video feeds aren't coming from someone sitting with a browser. Like those are coming from like, you know, real devices, um, real dedicated cameras that are speaking WebRTC, which is really exciting. I think it's the first time where we're going to have this ubiquitous video protocol that we can send things around. Um, next slide. And then if you're curious about this, so for me, I, I think it's important to always go one level lower than what you're building. So if you're building a, if you're building a, um, a website and you're doing some HTML and JavaScript, I think it's great to like maybe drop down and see how HTTP works. And that was the goal with WebRTC for the curious. I don't think this, especially when you're building something with 100 millisecond or you're building something maybe directly with Python, WebRTC for the curious isn't going to help you um, answer any questions about using those things. But what it will answer is like what's happening one level lower. 
And, um, you know, then you can understand like, hey, why does something work a certain way? As a developer, it's sometimes frustrating to think, oh, this was designed a poor way and I can do better than that. And it kind of brings humility to go and look and say like, this was designed for this reason and it helps you understand why certain things work the way they do. And then something I was really passionate about is the I was able to get interviews with a lot of the creators of the technologies behind WebRTC. So um, I got an interview with some of the developers from the Google team. I got interviews with developers who was working on video stacks and RTP back in the early 90s. Um, really exciting stuff. And it's and it's also it's exciting to see people get the credit for the work that they have done. You know, a lot of stuff is lost to history. So I hope that um, that this helps helps reveal some of that. Um, next slide. So this is kind of the theme of my part of this talk is WebRTC solves hard problems. So you don't have to, you know, you might be tempted to go and say like, oh, like I can go build this myself. I don't need to use, you know, Pion or I don't use, need to use hundred milliseconds. And so this is kind of a tour of just one little slice of why WebRTC is complex. And it's both, I, for me, awe-inspiring that people went and figured these things out and solved them and, and thought about them. And then also, um, I think it's just fun because, you know, you can, I hope that we can learn these things and then apply them to the other products we're working on. Uh, next slide. So here's the, here's the first interesting part about WebRTC. If you and another person want to have a call, WebRTC finds the best route. And that asterisk is the important part. Like, what is the best route? Um, it's, you know, you would think, okay, it's the, it's the fastest. Let's just go with a simple thing like that and see where it takes us. Next slide. So, well, here's some of the things we got to think about with real-time communication. The network quality can change. If you've ever been, um, you know, if you've ever been at home on a conference call and all of a sudden your teenage kids come home and jump and start streaming video, all of a sudden your call just falls apart. You know, you, you see a bunch of blockiness, you can't hear things. And that's, that's the first hurdle is you can't assume that the way the internet behaved 30 minutes ago is how it's going to behave right now. You'll see a lot of people that say, okay, like go and do a network speed test. And that's the amount of bit rate I can upload. That's not real. That's not how it works. Um, that's like, it measures it at that very moment, but the network can change at any time. And then the network path can change. So this is one that is becoming more and more common where if you're, let's say you're on a phone call and you're on um, LTE and then you walk inside, you want to switch to Wi-Fi. Or if you're on Wi-Fi and you have to go and go, go outside and get something, like the network path can change. So talk about dramatic network quality changes. You just went from having, you know, 100 gigabit upload to maybe 100 kilobits. Um, what you're sending can change. So right now I'm sending my... Um, webcam, but like, what if I wanted to enable my video? Like what, all, all to say is that just, you can't depend on anything. You can't assume that um, just because what happened five seconds ago, that those things will change. And then the next problem is that WebRTC happens in real time. So when you send a file, it's the way that bandwidth estimation works when sending things over the internet is you send some packets and then you ask the other side, Hey, did you get what I sent you? and you try to figure out what's the fastest amount you can send, and then you probe and do some things. So the details aren't the exciting part. But the thing is, with, with sending a file, it's okay if a little bit of data gets lost because you can resend it. But that's not how it works with WebRTC. Like if all of a sudden I started losing packets, um, you know, you wouldn't be able to hear me. So it's like with WebRTC, you have to figure out how much can you send and be very careful not to oversend, but also don't undersend because then, you know, it'll look like you're talking to someone from, from the 1980s. So it's like this like really careful balance of figuring, like, figuring out like where's that sweet spot. And then the last one is certain routes may have prohibitive costs where, you know, if there's like a very, and this is almost like a product decision where do you, if a user goes onto LTE, do you still want to do video? Or maybe it's best to switch to audio only. There's this very dynamic, like you have to understand what is happening um, you know, what are the, what's the video quality look like? It's, it's very dynamic. And then my last point is question mark, because I'm, I'm still learning this stuff. I've been doing WebRTC for about eight years now. And I realized that every, everything I like, 
when I, I feel like I knew things a year ago and then I look back and I'm like, man, I, I really didn't know as much, as much as I wish. And that goes today, you know, just today, um, we got a grant to have someone come start working on a bandwidth estimator for Pion. And this is, I'm amazed at the amount I'm learning from him as he, uh, as he goes. So that's, that's kind of, um, how you approach these things is even people that I, I spend my whole life working on this stuff and I still feel like I know nothing. So that's, that's the fun, that's the fun part. Uh, next slide. So let, let's just, let's just solve this problem of connecting. What, what do we do? So the base case would be the easiest one would be, okay, me and you are sitting next to each other in an office building and we know each other's IP addresses. I'm 192.168.01 and you're 0.2. We connect to each other. Boom. Well, what if we're in different networks? You know, what if we're each in our, at our homes? Um, and the other thing is we're not administrators on this network. You know, how, how do you talk to each other? I can give you my quote unquote public IP, but that doesn't mean anything. That just hits my router and the packets get, get dropped and there's nothing we can do. Um, what do we do here? You know, if I was designing something and I would think, okay, like I'll, I'll upload, do I need to upload my video somewhere and then someone else can fetch it? Like visualize, what would you do in the situation that me and you want to talk to each other and we had no direct connectivity? Next slide. Um, there's this really cool thing called NAT traversal. And NAT traversal is basically that outbound traffic will cause your router to create a temporary port forward. And this is like how the internet works, where if you go and hit google.com, google.com responds with a packet. And what your router says is, hey, you sent a packet to google.com in the last five nanoseconds. I'll send it back to, back to where it came from. And this is called NAT traversal. But there's a bunch of interesting rules around NAT traversal. Um, if I sent a packet to someone and it creates this temporary mapping, which allows this temporary port forward, um, do I create a new port forward for everyone I hit? Like, do I create a new temporary port forward for yahoo.com, for google.com, for amazon.com, or do I share one? Does every time that my computer goes out and makes a network request, do I share that temporary port forward? Um, what about who's allowed to use that temporary port forward? Let's say I go and I create a temporary port forward for hitting google.com. Can I then give it to a friend and say, hey, like I have this temporary port forward that you can send data back into me? And the answer is that it's completely undefined. Um, every, every network acts differently here. So you have some networks where peer-to-peer -peer is available because you can create these temporary mappings and you can talk to each other. So in the best case, what happens is that um, if two people want to be on a conference call, we both send up a packet and that packet comes back and then we have this temporary hole in our router and our firewall that then we can talk to each other. And that's super exciting because that means that, you know, you get the best routes, you go directly from your ISPs, you don't have to go up to a server and come back. Um, it's end-to-end -end secure. You don't have to worry about, you know, like what happens to that data at rest, what's happening if it flows through my servers. Lots of, um, opens up lots of interesting possibilities. So there's the first case. Next slide. And then WebRTC also in the case that if you don't have NAT traversal at all, it does have a relay servers or what we call proxies. So this turn server, you go up and create a temporary allocation and it says, okay, like I, I need you to allow me to send traffic through you so we can talk to each other. And, uh, you know, I think both of these concepts are incredibly applicable, even if you're not building with something with WebRTC. You, you know, you can imagine like um, IoT and embedded devices, you know, it, like why should my um, smart fridge have to go and upload my data to a server for me to fetch it later? I sh it should be able to connect directly to each other. Um, you know, I'm really excited about this IoT space and robotics. Like there's, there's all these places where we can have great data saving and we can have great privacy improvements by having things be peer to peer. Uh, next slide. Sean, one question here. Uh, maybe it is out of scope, but like, don't you think this should be simplified? I mean, uh, like, couldn't routers do something more simpler, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> 
Yeah, you would think like I honestly don't know the history behind it. So I I asked um I have a couple people that I've asked and I'm like what like what is the history behind this? Like how did we arrive at Natraversal? And pretty much everyone's like it works as I dis- as I discovered it, and it was kind of this tribal knowledge. Um I wish I I wish I did know the answer. I would love to call up every router provider and be like, "Hey, can we settle on a specific thing?" Um, <laughs> yeah. But do you think IPv6 will solve it finally? Like if, if IPv6 becomes the thing, mm-hmm. uh, then every each of, each and everything in the world will have mm-hmm. its own unique IP address. And yeah. will that work? Like, do you think that will theoretically work then? I'm, I'm hopeful. The only thing that I've heard that kind of scares me is a lot of people, even with IPv6, they still will put them behind a NAT for security reasons. Because they're like, hey, well, you know, why should my TV and why should my fridge have a public IP? Like, does that open me up to more? Does that like create like an attack vector by having my stuff be publicly addressable? Um, I see yeah. it both ways. It's like, hey, like maybe the software should be better, but then why open something up if you don't need it to be opened up? And then, um, and then another concept that gets like deeper in the web you see, which is what you've been solving, is. Um, you know, this is all kind of applicable to, you know, one-to-one calls, but like if you want to upload video to a hundred people, you don't want to have a peer-to-peer connection with every single person. You want to upload it once and then have a server distribute it. So, um, we're not even getting into that scary part, but yeah, this is, uh, yeah, I, I'm very curious what the future holds. It's kind of yeah. amazing what yeah. we, what yeah. we figured out. Yeah. Because I've, I've, I've heard of the stories of Nat Traversal. I mean, uh, yeah. there, there are like gateways which actually change not just change the ip address they they go change something in the sdp and like mm-hmm. why are you touching the sdp <laughs> right it and is, if we'll stop here yeah no it is it is wild and it's like and these changes like in this route in the router firmware are made like 20 years ago and they're just like you know stepping along yeah there was a huge security vulnerability in uh, chromium because i think it was you can if you oh if you can so when you send a stun message, they were they were shoving data in the stun message, and they were like able to attack things. Like it's it's crazy how many. Uh, so yeah, but I love it. I mean, you know, we talk about crazy, but yeah, I just it's yeah, so yeah. much fun figuring this stuff out. Um, uh, next slide. Yeah. So then here comes like, I wish all this crazy complexity could be easier, but you know, we just talked about these three connectivity types. Um, you have like your like local IP, you have your public IP, and then you have these relay servers. And like the details in the slide aren't so important, but just kind of like look at the complexity here. On each side is each WebRTC connection and all the ways that it's available. And you see all these twisty colors. And this is like what we have to deal with is like, how do you figure out the best possible route to con- to communicate between these two peers? and when you're rolling something out to production and you're debugging and you're like, why didn't things connect it? Because, you know, one user has a different network and another user has a different network and the network conditions are always changing. So, um, so yeah, this is, this is the story of why, um, this stuff is frustrating and, uh, maybe not a problem that, that you want to be dealing with at one in the morning. Um, next slide. And even beyond this, there's like even more network complexity. Um, if you have multiple routes, which you use, let's say like I can connect via my, you know, private IP and my public IP. Um, what if, what if one route has is faster, you know, you can send a packet faster, but you have more packet loss or one has more bandwidth, but one, um, has greater round trip time. You know, there's just so much dynamicism to this. And, um, honestly, WebRTC hasn't solved all these problems when you, um, go and use a WebRTC implementation. Um, you know, there's a lot of things they don't measure here. Even with Pion, like when choosing when choosing the network route, we just go to the fast, we go to the one that establishes the fastest and is the least complex. So we prefer that you you connect IP to I, you know, direct IPs. And then we at the last result, we go to the relay servers. So um, that's the complexity here. And it's it's an interesting problem and it kind of applies to any product you build today with, um, you know, you solve that base case and make things work, but then you think like how much better it could be and all the different things you could measure. But then if you make it too complicated, how do you even know that what you're measuring improves anything? You know, 
I could add a million lines of code to Pion to measure all these things, but maybe it would never help a single user. Um, again, another question mark. Who knows where this will take me? Next slide. Yeah, so any questions? And um, and they don't have to be WebRTC specific. They could be like, hey, like, how does this NAT traversal, could this apply to this other thing I'm building? Or, um, you know, what was the most complicated part of NAT traversal when learning it? Or maybe if you're interested in, in deeper, deeper details. It could be any questions, guys. I mean, uh, we, we just broke it down to multiple questions because, I mean, taking questions at the end of the session sometimes, I mean, we lose questions then. <laughs> And um, and if and if a question comes to you later, like feel free to email me or reach out in um, any of the ways I'm on the internet. So, all right, I'll I'll, I'll uh, cool. if, if there there is, is there a question? No, there is no question. <laughs> all right, guys, we'll like keep putting your questions if you have in the chat or in the in the Q and A, and and we'll I'll, I'll pause and take it whenever whenever I have it. Cool. So I think this is what uh, Sean wants to say that, uh, and actually. Uh, Shitaj, sorry, uh, there's someone who's raised his hand. Which I, should I just hand the mic over to him? Yes, yes, please. Oh, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hey, Karthik. Hey, yeah. Uh, so this is exciting. I mean, I can remember like uh, going through a lot of trouble in learning all these network uh, terminologies and a lot of things that when I started learning about uh, like, like a lot of things where like when you come from a typical web development background, like you, you try to learn about this, um, like what is topology, what is ice. Natural was a you to learn sometimes like when it, uh, it's really common, but a lot of other things are a little uh, challenging to wrap around initially, and this is exciting too, that you have uh, simplified here. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, I, I hope you will be coming to that, but I just wanted to learn, like, how do you select different solutions that is available, even if it is a open source or if it is a, a service, uh, like if, if there are like a studio, there is a, a top box and a lot of other things that that like where do i go for 100 ms and there are like other open source solutions like um uh, media soup or uh, janus another thing that i've been trying to learn around so what do i should be on so that that is that is my question right i mean i'm trying to learn out of this so i hope you will be coming to that and yeah that, that's it and thank you yeah 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 uh it's it's an interesting question because i think it, it it's the answer is different to what kind of developer you are. Um, I think a lot of like the reasons that why we pick software or like a, a platform is it might not even be about like what is the best technical solution, but maybe what is the solution? What is the solution that you feel most passionate about? You know, I talk to a lot of developers and they're like, I really love Python. I would say that even as much as I work on on Python, I would say go and use AI, AIO RTC because that's like the thing that you'll be happiest to work on, you'll make the most productivity. Um, and so, yeah, I don't like, I don't think, and like the things are, and things are always changing. Um, you know, today, like media soup could be better, tomorrow Janus could be better, and then the next day Pine could be better. It's like the roadmaps are always changing. Um, I would say I always recommend like, what do you feel the most passionate about and like where do you feel the most support and community? And that's, um, and like what kind of lines up with like the way you see the world, you know, I think um, like, especially with something like 100 milliseconds, it's like you have this big repository of, you know, React examples and other things like that. And maybe that's like, as a developer, that's what um, lines with you most. Yeah. So sorry if that's, there's not a direct answer on like, what's the best WebRTC thing? More of like, that's how I pick my software. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to answer uh, between... Uh open source versus the the commercial uh, 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 but choosing which web rtc it's it's just hard work i mean uh, we we have at at hernames we will try to publish more and more comparisons but finally it's your choice guys i mean you will have to choose <laughs> irf can, can you hear me, me? yes we, we can hear you Arif. Okay, so uh, 
my question is uh, what's the best success rate of p2p you can expect with the web rtc yeah um the only time i've ever seen the numbers published was that um appear.in and now whereby they um philip hankey did this really good article and i think that it was around 80 percent but then that completely changes like on what on like what your customer base looks like you know if you have like if you're building a product that's like targeted at corporate customers, they, they might have a really low success rate just because those are the kind of people that are joining. Um, so, so yeah, I guess the answer is like, what is what is your user base look like, and um, and then you kind of go from there. I don't think like I I don't think I can give a singular answer, but I'll share in the chat a really good article on the numbers that whereby pulled and like what they um, what they got and the reasons they got it. Arif, uh, your P2P is uh, more like a like a WhatsApp call. You're talking like uh, similar to. Uh, like... It's it's more about screen sharing data uh, where uh, one computer is streaming and other computer is consuming. Something like uh, let's say two two VS Code instances doing a code review, kind of. Is that? Something yeah, like yeah. You you could assume that I'm I'm actually talking about the remote access space. Uh, rather than the video streaming but but the networking stack is same and it works the same way like yeah. capturing a screen of one computer and streaming that to the other computer it is one on one it is not one to n got it i think p just p2p uh, as as uh, sean said i mean your your mileage will vary but i think sean if we add the turn and this uh, turn then then it will improve right yeah i think um I'm not aware of any situations where you couldn't get full connectivity. It's like WebRTC, if if you can load a website, you can use WebRTC because you turn um, can do, you can have a TCP connection up to your turn server or you can have a TLS connection up to your turn server. So I think um, as far as I'm aware, there is no network out there where you can load a website, but you can't make WebRTC work. But you have to know your software and configure it all right. Yeah. Yeah. So Arif, I mean, I think the correct answer is like, uh, okay, first of all, it is complicated. It is not as simple as loading at as www.google.com. It is complicated. And hence, uh, hence we're talking about it. Like how do, how do we make it simpler for you guys? So, so that these questions kind of questions actually don't, don't appear. And I think we are a little further from there, but yeah, I mean, that is what at least at hundred MS we are, we are working on. And Sean is also like working on the same same thing to to make make answering these things simpler. I mean, like these days, do you does people ask like how like how many cores I do I need in the operating system? Or how many threads do I need in the operating system? Like those questions are like people don't ask those questions anymore now, right? Like uh, or very less, right? That WebRTC has not become an operating system yet. I mean, and, and I think uh, that is what. Pion and 100ms and a lot of other companies are trying to do. We're not there yet, Arif. And sorry for sorry for keeping this question again, Gray. <laughs> yeah. All right. Shall we shall we move on? And then we got a QA question. Yeah. Thanks. I'll look for that article, Sean. Yeah. No, I shared it in the uh, chat. Hopefully that uh, came through. Okay, so there is a question which says Zoom is a typical circle one model. Does remote control of desktop over Zoom fall under WebRTC protocol as well? I think it does, right, Sean? What, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, there's um, I mean, never install is a great example of that. Of um, like, I can't speak to like what exactly WebRTC uses or what Zoom uses, but WebRTC for remote control does work well. Um, and the way it works is we have those binary data channels where they send, you know, mouse and key press events, and then they send the video over the video streams, you know, just like right now. So um, WebRTC works works well for remote control. Cool. We'll move on, guys, uh, and take more questions. Uh... So yeah, I mean, just 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 the message here. Like, I think it's pretty loud and clear that WebRTC is not an operating system yet. <laughs> uh, and 
I just just as a corollary, I would say Pion is what was Pion is building the operating system, and 100 MS is building the Docker on that. <laughs> like I, I'll I'll go into the details. What what does that mean basically? Right. Um, but just just as a uh, introduction, like why uh, why I started even working on this, or 100 MS started working on this. So last year, uh, like a lot of 100 MS team members were at Hotstar, and we were building this uh, application called Watch Party at Hotstar. And uh, we used a uh, uh, like a platform as a service, like a, a CPaaS, and it still took us four months to build uh, with a with a with a world class video team already, right? And and that is why we keep on saying like if you if if we would have started with open source, it's not that we would have not have delivered it. We would have delivered it, but it would have taken us six months, right? The same thing we did it with a CPaaS. It still took us four months, right? And this is what Kind of was frustrating for us that why it takes so much time to build a production ready uh, uh, system which works for the masses, right? And I think working for the masses is the is the key point here, right? Working for 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 a for a special class people who have good internet, good Wi-Fi, everything, good phones. Yeah, I mean that probably is easy, but like the kind of uh, uh, people Hotstar serves, right? Like Hotstar is serving every tier two, tier three city, right? There it becomes hard where you have phones which are like less than ten thousand rupees cost and like has issues and whatnot, right? So I'll go into the details, right? Like so, current abstractions, right? Uh, and this this I'm talking about both open source and CPaaS, right? Uh, are too low level for building Zoom level experience, right? The abstractions are as of now mostly stream level abstractions, right? Which is like um, Actually, I want to add one more thing, by the way, sorry. Um, so what, what, what Sean explained, right? Uh, a lot of cool things about WebRTC. WebRTC is amazing, right? Uh, and it solves a lot of really, really hard, complicated problems. But it is not solving, it does not solve it for a conferencing. It solves it for a P2P, for a peer-to-peer. That is what WebRTC uh, does, right? Like, so when you go to this use case where there are four people watching a cricket match, this is a much more complicated thing. Uh, and it's an application of WebRTC. Like, right, what, what WebRTC does amazingly well is how do you do things with two people, right? Uh, but beyond that, it leaves it up to you. I mean, it's it's the basic unit, but like you can, you can extend that unit and keep building. Uh, but it leaves a lot onto you, right? Um, so yeah, the current abstractions, um, they give you stream level abstractions. By stream, I mean one audio stream, one video stream, one screen share stream, one data stream, blah, blah, right? Uh, it doesn't handle the device nuances, right? And uh, I, I'll go into more details, but devices, um, especially the mobile phones, uh, sub $100 Android phones, they they are crazy, right? Like all the echoes we hear because, because the eco hardware eco canceller does not work in that device, right? Or the device device says I have uh, uh, I have a decoder, but when you start video decoding it, th that decoder is not present. So I mean, it, there are just tons of device nuances. Um, and the third one is network network, which which Sean already explained that network is already uh, amazingly complex, right? And uh, if you think about from a user point of view, right? Like, like we are all a lot of technical people here, but like if you think from a user perspective, users don't care about NAT traversal or WebRTC or or device problems. Like what, what they care about it, like my video should work, right? That is what they care about. And Zoom has kind of set the bar here, right? Uh, Zoom works in bad internet connections. The, the footprint is kind of minimal. It still works on a 4G. The device doesn't get heated up. It handles a lot of camera, mic, idiosyncrasies, right? There are like a bunch of features uh, which Zoom gives, right? Like you, you get you get whiteboard, you get uh, you, the host can control the audio video of some certain participants, right? You can do share screens. Like in the natural way of uh, collaborating, Zoom has set the now expectation, right? And we are still talking about stream level abstractions the the NAT traversals and those kind of problems right and that is where it kind of breaks down while building a product right 
<laughs> I'll go to the next level where, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about the same thing, right? Like uh, this, this thing, uh, the abstractions, right? Since the uh, the underlying layer, which we are talking the calling as abstractions, this underlying layer is not aware of business logic at all, right? So I, I'm taking two examples here, right? Like uh, one example on my right is a, is a phone. Uh, and typically you must have also seen in your Google Meet or Zoom that you only see four tiles, right? There must be 100 people, but you only see four tiles. Uh, there is a reason to that, that phones do not have those many decoders. When you do it on a desktop, Zoom shows you up to 50 tiles, but on a phone, only four tiles are shown, right? Now, <clears throat> since the underlying uh, kind of uh, uh, operating system or uh, underlying library SDK is not not taking this into consideration, what the underlying library is giving you is like, okay, download, uh, get these, get these streams and play it. That is what the library is do doing it for you. But if you don't take care of this, it does not work. Like if there is a, if there is a 50 people call. And if you try to display all 50 uh, uh, streams on the phone, the phone will crash hundred percent. It, it will not work on the phone. Right. And it will heat up so much that it won't work. Uh, the second example I'm taking here is a is a desktop example, uh, but if you can see, there are there are certain people who are in the pinned mode. There are certain people who are on the sidebar, right? Uh, the pinned video needs higher resolution because it's a it's a larger uh, larger tile, so it needs higher quality, right? Again, this this is not given by abstractions. These abstractions only talk in terms of streams, and it gives you the control that okay, what what resolution, what bitrate you want to choose. And hence, there is a constant battle between these three things, which I'm showing you. Uh, what is the quality? The re resolution is kind of a uh, proxy to the quality. Uh, what is my device CPU usage uh, and network usage? Balancing these three uh, is not easy, guys. Right? Like you have to find these optimal parameters. And, and as Sean was also saying that. These parameters are dynamic. Things are changing around, right? So that means you have to kind of uh, keep finding these dynamically. And further, the parameters are different for every person in, in a conference call, right? Like we are not talking P2P anymore, right? In, in a P2P, WebRTC takes care of this. Sean, do you agree with that? Any any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, and it's... And it's amazing how it's like constantly changing. Like it's, we're not going to go into the, probably the details today, but it's, um, you have simulcast and SVC and AV1. It's like, this is like a never ending battle. And it's why I love the field so much. It's that um, it's like, things are just starting to get interesting. Like we, we have a lot to, a lot to solve still. Exactly. Exactly. Um... And as I like, I keep calling it operating system. Then that's why <laughs> it will eventually become an operating system. <laughs> cool. Um, what hundred MS is doing is uh, we we are basically st still building an open SDK. Uh, and the reason I call it open SDK uh, is uh, the SDK is not kind of uh, there is another way to build these kind of uh, or solve these problems. Is let's say. Uh, Zoom, zoom uh, like whereby or Zoom, right? Uh, the way they solve it is like, okay, you, you, you will give you the UI itself and uh, you just embed the UI in the, in an iframe, right? Uh, that is one way to solving it so that the, everything is hidden. Even the UI is also kind of then abstracted out, right? The way at least at 100MS we are solving it is like we are, we, we are building an open SDK where we don't control the UI at all. Um, but we kind of work on these, all the parameters, which I was showing you in the previous slide is, is, is handled by the SDK. Um, and, and what parameters we're talking about, I'll, I'll kind of cover those parameters, right? Um, the parameters are primarily these three, um, the, the, like go to a higher level abstraction, handle the device nuances and handle the network edge cases, right? Um, And by the way, we we have chosen Pion as our uh, base. Uh, so we uh, under the hood, 100ms uses uh, Pion. Um, 
and we were when we were evaluating uh, uh, the open source choice for 100 ms i mean the first thing we lo- loved about python was like it uses golang so it is it is modern right uh, c++ is great uh, but again c++ abstraction versus golang abstraction golang is better at abstraction that's what that's what uh, at least uh, uh, the, the engineering team believes right it is scalable it is it is i mean and we did test actually by the way uh, among all of them uh, uh, the, the ones right um, um, pion is giving like almost like 1500 streams on a single core uh, right um, so we have not seen similar results with media soup i mean it might have changed but yeah i mean as, at that time we were testing we were, we, we were not uh, uh, we did not get those kind of results and obviously the great community right like the, the, that that matters the most uh, uh, as as Sean was also saying, like choosing Python versus GoLang. I mean, yeah. I mean, you, if you're comfortable with Python, choose Python, right? I'll uh, I'll basically uh, maybe I think maybe we are running out of time also. But uh, uh, let me let me show you guys a quick demo uh, of uh, what what hundred ms has done, right? Uh, or what kind of abstraction it has started to give, right? I'll go to the 100ms dashboard, and what I'm what I'll do is uh, so this is 100ms dashboard, and what I'm doing is I will try to create a AirMeet like app, right? So I will create a webinar app, uh, the kind of app we are t- we are talking right now. So I'll choose something uh, something like a virtual event, uh, create this app here. So as you can see right now, even even in our current webinar, right, uh, we have a stage where me, Sean, and other people are there. There is a backstage, right, like uh, where maybe Shweta has gone to the backstage, and then there are like uh, tons of viewers, uh, like like you who who are joined as viewers, right. Um, this is the way, at least, the product managers uh, or 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 at a, like a. Uh, a like when you start building a product, this is this is the kind of abstraction you want to think at first, right? That I have these roles. I have a backstage, I have a stage, and a viewer, right? Um, and I'll I'll go further into these roles. Uh, this is what hundred ms allows you to do. That okay, if you are at a if you are a stage, what can you do? You can share your audio, you can share your video, you can share your screen. What quality do you want to share? What quality do you want to uh, do? Do screen share? What permissions do you have, right? Um, and who else can you see, right? This subscribe means who else can you see? So at this, I'm saying a stage person can see other other person on the stage, and that is why let's say me and Sean will be able to see each other, right? If you go to the, go to the viewer role, viewer is like, okay, you can't share anything. Viewer, as a viewer, you, you're not allowed to share anything. Uh, uh, who do you who do you view? You view Anybody who is on the stage, you kind of view everybody on the stage, right? And the viewer has no permissions, right? And something like, a, what is a backstage? A backstage is the area where we're kind of re- getting ready, right? So me, me and Sean first joined on the backstage and then came on the stage, right? So on the backstage also, you can still share audio, still share video, but uh, uh, and on the backstage, you can you can see the stage also, right? But the stage folks cannot see the backstage. And by the way, when when uh, let's say we we asked people for uh, questions, like so, we were able to get some viewers on the stage. Um, this is this is also we have abstracted, right? Like that somebody can the, the person on the stage can change any participant's role. And this is what we were doing uh, when when uh, let's say uh, RS joined us for a question on stage. I'll 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 uh, go back basically to the slides, uh, but the reason I kind of showed this uh, uh, demo is to show like from what abstraction to what abstraction uh, we have to reach. Give me one second. So I'll just go back to the slides. Yeah, I, I hope. I mean, you can sign up yourself. You can build build things on on your own, right? But the the primary thing, 
uh, or the abstract the, the the basic abstraction level we are going from a stream level to a temp, to a role level because i mean what i believe is like every app, every real world application will have some roles and those roles will have rules and that is how when you build a product you think about right uh, you don't think about uh, will the video work or not right video has to work right uh, you you start uh, thinking in terms of roles first and then making video work should be the underlying systems uh, job right um, i'll just rush through this but like the core develop core principles when we build this is like uh, the application code should exist in infrastructure sdk layer right there is a lot of in the web rtc world there there is a lot of application code which still needs to be written up and we think it should move into the infrastructure layer there is a lot of logic which client apps need to be a uh, uh, lot of logic which goes into the client app right so things like let's say what codec should i be using uh, what, what bitrate should i be using right all of these settings i mean these settings you are, you kind of uh, uh, developers are kind of burning it into the client apps which it shouldn't i feel right it should it should be uh, dynamic and changeable or or even the simple things like uh, who can i see like if you if you think about the way okay let, let me give an example right so let's say if you are building the, this webinar page or this webinar application without the concept of roles the way you will develop is you will have an application and in the application when you say when i am joining as a viewer then go subscribe everybody on the stage right this is what application code will write this application code will be repeated on your ios android web everywhere right while tomorrow let's say if you introduce a new thing right that there is there is a new concept in the whole uh, there is a new concept of let's say subscription or something that means the application has to change now right while if you kind of keep these rules on the server of who subscribes to whom and what not and push it out to your applications that kind of makes it uh, easier to not update client tabs because i mean i, I mean like ask me like at at hotstar scale when we had to update applications it was it was uh, it was a nightmare right people people stay on the applications for like 6 months one year more than that and the third obvious one is like the video must play right if, if the video doesn't play then nothing else matters again i'll i'll uh, quickly jump through this uh, but this is this is what we now define in the room template right like uh, what to publish right uh what are the parameters right like uh, this is what the publish parameters kind of uh, now define uh subscribe like what to subscribe right uh what are the subscribe parameters right permissions right uh the recording like if you see even this con this conference is getting recorded there is a recording button right uh this conference can be broadcasted also so you want to kind of uh, put it put the broadcast configuration also right so that is why i said if webrtc is the operating system uh 100 ms is the docker <laughs> right so do docker is where you define <coughs> your application and then sdk kind of uh, solves these uh, problems for you guys right and uh, instead of writing hundreds of lines of code to just code it up now with with 100 ms like implementation uh on the application side you just join with the role and the role the sdk already knows the business logic that if you join with the viewer role then you are only doing this right if you join with the stage role then what what is supposed to be done is already defined in the template right and hence the time to kind of uh, market reduces for the application developers uh and not just time to market right i mean think about this like why is zoom able to do work so well because zoom knows the business logic right zoom knows that when the network drops off and you have to reconnect and if you are a viewer then you have to resubscribe all the people on the stage now if you are doing it in the application level that means the application needs to be aware of all these retries and what not and, and guys like don't think me wrong but retry is one of the hardest things to build <laughs> like it seems like retry is easy but like retry is one of the hardest things to build uh, to make it things resilient right uh, what what we 
but however what i'm saying is don't retry on the application give that job to the sdk let the, let sdk do that job for of retrying and what not sdk now handles the device errors because you have told sdk that uh, you will be publishing hence you handle uh, the device problems right sdk handles all the network complexity which sean was showing and sdk handles uh, again the network thing like uh, the edge cases right i'll, I'll pause here uh, one more time to take any questions i uh, and there is one do we have any limitation of webrtc in mobile browsers <laughs> sean you want, you want to take it up or yeah this is um this is a and it's like an interesting problem as well like so yeah not all webrtc clients are created equal so you have a problem of the um you don't have codex support everywhere and so for a long time in google chrome you didn't have um h264 if you didn't have a hardware device and at the same time in safari they didn't support vpx vp8 and vp9 at all so literally there were devices that couldn't even talk to each other just because of their codec support and now recently um that it only in like i think in the past year has safari even seen year or two has far even seen WebRT support so so yes um the, the i think the situation was a lot the situation now is a lot better than what it was but i think we still have a long way to go um and again my my attitude about this about this all is like we're still in the very early days i know it feels like you know webrtc is widely available and works everywhere and you can use it on safari chrome firefox everything but um i still think it has a long way to go and i think it's it's the best answer that we have um so i'd be curious to hear your opinion on this because I, I think mine's like a little more theoretical just because i like you know I, I dabble with the stuff and i i find it fun but like yeah what's the production experience yeah yeah yeah. i'll, I'll give more a more practical uh thing here uh guys like the, what we have seen is uh chrome <coughs> chrome mostly works right uh firefox and safari are uh, a little behind on this and sometimes unpredictable uh what we have seen in the world is that the chrome even on mobile web works well the one of the biggest problems however is that chrome there is no native chrome on ios <laughs> and it's a very interesting thing that even chrome on safari is using internally it is using the safari right i, I don't understand why right shan do, do you have an answer to that like i don't know why right so chrome on the chrome on uh, ios platforms internally is using some webkit implementation right and that screws it up uh, even the chrome on safari uh, on, on ios right uh, but chrome generally i feel is, uh, is is good right so the order of order of things the way it work is chrome works best the next best is your uh, safari and firefox and then the worst is these uh, uh, samsung browsers and so there are like embedded browsers um uh, by the device manufacturers and yeah we like i will just raise my hand there like i don't know right <laughs> they like wild wild west they will not work right uh, so yes there are limitations uh, you have to kind of solve it via product and the way to solve it via product is you find what browsers are supported you show people that please use this browser and if they don't have that browser you have to kind of uh, 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 nudge them to install that okay i don't understand what that question is which video codecs are supported shown on take it yeah yeah so um the webrtc mandates that you should that you must support um vp8 and h264 and i would say that you can pretty much depend on those being available everywhere um, and then you also have vp9 and um and now av1 is available in chrome and then only in safari can you use h265 and then on the audio side you have opus 
and then you have um, Ulon, and you have like PCM, and I think that's about it that you'll run into into production device. I would say like I would I would bet that the majority of calls use VP8 um, just because that's what Chrome puts its preference as, and um, most of the time it just works. Uh, yeah, just my color to this again is that uh, uh, it's complicated, right? <laughs> because it's not about WebRTC, it is about devices. Which device supports which codec? And the problem is that uh, when you do a P2P, you can do a negotiation, perfect negotiation that, oh, I will send you X, you send me Y, and we're fine, right? But when it becomes like, let's say, if uh, three people call, right? Now, how do you agree? Five people call. How do you agree, right? Um, and you basically kind of most most of the times you agree to the lowest common denominator, which is not the best. And that's VP8 is the lowest common denominator. I I think I think it's a it's a pretty ugly situation. I mean, in my view. <laughs> there are much much advanced codecs which we could have which we can use here. Cool. Next question: Which cloud providers is good and economical for mobile video apps? Uh, I'm not sure I understand this question. Can we maybe uh, put more details on the chat while we come back to this question? OK, uh, so Sean, you want to take the next section? Yeah. Um, so this is my perspective on working on Pion for the last couple of years. And why I continue to do it and why I think it'd be worth for other people to do it. Uh, next slide. So open source is incredibly rewarding as an individual, you know, even just right here, right now, um, this is a fantastic experience. You know, I get to interact with all these people I've never met before. I get to um, talk about WebRTC and I feel very lucky to hopefully have an impact on all the products will go and build in a little way. And for me, um, Pine is fun because I, you know, I build without compromise. I, I, whatever I think is best, um, I go and do. So, um, and you can do that too. Like I think in a lot of times when you're building a commercial product, you know, you have these um, pressures coming down from the business. You know, you have these things you need to meet. And the nice thing with open source is you can build things just as you want which I found is very fun. And then as an individual, you, you also kind of control your career career outside of a job. So if um, for me, you know, I've been doing, been working in tech for about 10 years. And a lot of times, you know, it depends on, you know, what, what projects are you on and, you know, how's your relationship with your manager and other things like that. With open source, um, you, people are able to go look at your code on GitHub and they kind of determine what, what kind of developer you are and, um, it's made a big impact on my life. And then with this, you know, um, you know, you meet passionate, interesting people and have these great life experiences. And another one that I've really come to appreciate is you debug and learn outside of work. So now when I work on WebRTC stuff, it's nice that I've already, already run into it with Pion. So, you know, if, hey, my video doesn't work or, hey, like something's crashing, I've been lucky enough that, I, that I've had to help Pion users debug it already. So... At work, it makes me makes it seem like I work really fast, but really, I've just been lucky enough that I ran into that bug three months ago. And then, of course, there's always the uh, GitHub stars. So if if all else fails, you can watch those go up. Um, but as a joke, like it is, it is validating to see people use your software um, as a developer. Like one of the things you just you always wanted to build something that people want to use, and uh, I encourage like even if you have a um, interesting idea and you don't know if it'll take off like just put it on github announce it on hacker news and just see where it goes uh, next slide and open source is rewarding as a company so how great would it be that if you put your code out there you know your sdks on github and your your developers and users will go and fix bugs themselves. You know, there's no reason they don't have to file tickets. They can just go and look at the code and open a pull request. And if you build community, users will actually go and evangelize your software for you. So if you're 
communicating with your users and you're on GitHub and Slack and you're communicating with them one-to-one, -one, they're going to go and tell other people what a great experience they've had. And another one is uh, it creates a very unique hiring funnel with a lot of advantages that you don't get from others. So you can go and hire developers who already contributed. You find a lot of developers who are hard to find and recruit. So you have a lot of people that will contribute to code, but they don't do a good job of promoting themselves. So you won't find them on LinkedIn or they'll have a very sparse um, profile, but through GitHub, you'll, they'll contribute and you'll be able to reach out to them. So I've, I've talked to a lot of companies that have made some amazing hires just because they're out there doing open source. Um, next slide. And if you're going to build an open source project, here's a couple of things that I've learned along the way that um, that were kind of hard lessons. Um, one of the things that I was very lucky that I that I did early on was um, build an MVP and get it out as soon as possible and accept compromises with your feature list. Um, I see a lot of open source projects where people have such big dreams that they're afraid to launch. The first version of Pion started out with a lot of C dependencies, and those are all gone today. It's in pure Go. And a lot of things that um, that now we depend on, you know, renegotiation, simulcast, ice restarts. These are all things that people um, wouldn't be able to ship with. But it was great to get that first version out and get the excitement because it both motivated me and it got other people involved. Another thing is contributors aren't free. Um, one of the things I thought that if I build Pion out big enough that it'll kind of just sustain itself because enough people get involved. But I found is a lot of contributors actually cost more than they give. So you'll have, um, you know, someone who's just learning how to code or they don't really know GitHub and I'll spend time helping them. And it's something you need to embrace and realize that, that yeah, like these, this contributor isn't making Pion better, but here's a chance that you can go improve their life. You know, I, there's a couple developers I've worked with where they learned to do open source through Pion and they went out went on to later get great careers out of it or build something very interesting. So um, I consider it worth it, but it's just something going in that you should be aware of. A lot of times you'll actually end up getting better code if you just go write it yourself. There's no magic bullet where you can democratize it and then have an army of contributors that go and do things for you. Um, next slide. And then um, a big one is online presence. So when I started this project, I didn't have a LinkedIn. I didn't have a Reddit account. I didn't have any any Twitter. Like I was, all that stuff kind of scared me. Um, but I kind of embraced it with this project. And so I answered questions on Stack Overflow under the WebRTC tag. I use Twitter and Reddit and all that stuff. And, um, and I, I really enjoy it now because I get to see like where are people having problems. And I was also surprised at, the things that people liked about Pion. So, you know, things that I never realized why um, people were using the project, you know, they really enjoyed how easy it was to build or they really enjoyed how easy, how easy it was to read. Um, these things that I only learned later that had happened accidentally that I've embraced more and more. So I would encourage, you know, go out and interface with users. You'll learn, you'll be surprised at why they love your project. And then automate everything. This is, you it's amazing how much time can be lost. You think, oh, like I'll just go and I'll fix people's commits manually or, oh, I'll go and, you know, fix those tests. Just don't, don't do that to yourself. You'll burn so much time and you'll, you'll burn out. Um, this is something that I had spent a lot of time up front doing because um, every time someone would contribute, something would break. So this is, this is an important one. And so one other one that's important is users should be able to run in five minutes, you know, a lot of open source projects. There's a lot of really great open source projects that the um, the creators and the maintainers just don't care about other people using it. You know, they want to build this beautiful thing, and they enjoy it. And the new users aren't that important. But I found I think a lot of success of Pion has been really because of Go is so easy to build and use. So if you're building a project, like really and really think about what that first run experience is like because you'll be amazed at um, what a difference it makes. When I get so many people that say like, oh, I want to go use this WebRTC implementation. It was just too difficult to get started. And so then I started using Pion. And these users, highly technical, highly smart, but they just, people don't want to deal with it. Like this isn't, this isn't about like, you're making the setup, you're lowering the bar on the, on the, on the account of users. 
I mean, you just you have experts that just don't have the patience to do 15 minutes of setup versus five minutes. So, um, so really embrace that, and, like drive down that tech debt. And um, next slide. This is five minutes. Power of five minutes is so interesting, Sean. I think uh, <laughs> it is uh, indeed like uh, compiling web RTC. Like the first time I was compiling it, it took me more than a day. Just to compile web RTC, okay? I mean, and I was like, <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> I even now, like even every time I pull, um, you know, the build changes or something changes or my patches don't apply. Yeah, it's um, but there's yeah, there's not really a motivation to change it. So that's um, I got very lucky. Like I kind of fell into that niche. Cool guys. I mean, thank you, Sean. I mean, that was um, I mean. Um... It's yeah. We'll we'll come to deeper questions. Like like let me let me let me uh, click. Uh, like there is a question. I think uh, uh, Shweta, can you uh, put the next question? Like there is a question from Sembian. Yeah, I think so. This is a great question, by the way. Uh, Shweta is selling buy. Sean is selling build. If you were to build a version of Gmeet for SaaS B two B enterprise productivity tool today, which would you recommend? Build versus buy. Uh, so let me let me try to answer this. Okay, I mean this is I like, and I'll I'll have all the disclaimers that this is not a perfect answer. It's a discussion, right? And uh, we're open. Like now we can open this discussion to as many people as as you want, right? I mean because th this is the meat of it. Um, so can you can you can you uh, uh, remove the question? I'll I'll just present a slide. Yeah. So. This is the kind of uh, slide I made, right? And again, open to discussion, guys. Um, but if you are an enthusiast, right? If you're trying something, I would definitely encourage evaluate both, right? So open source, so it's basically OSS, open source versus let's say SaaS, right? You must evaluate both when you are an enthusiast, right? Um, the second stage is uh, uh, you're basically going to find your product fit. Right and finding the product fit. By this time, you should have chosen one, because if you're still choosing what uh, underlying stack to use, then that means you're not focusing on your product. Right. So, so by this time, you should choose one. Right. Um, and I'm talking about like let's say growing to hundred hundred uh, MAU and those kind of stuff. Right. The third stage is your uh, growing the usage. Right. Like where. We're saying now let me I have kind of probably found some product market fit. Let's let's grow the usage, right? Um scale with your choice, right? Like whatever choice you have made, scale with it. It does not matter at this time, right? Um because I think again, product matters more, scale matters more. Are more people adapting your product that matters more than your choice of underlying stack, right? If you chose a wrong stack, it won't scale at this time, right? Uh, so yes, then you go back to uh, go back to step uh, one, basically, right? <clears throat> After this, you will hit a stage where you now say, okay, oh, I'm doing hundred million minutes a month. Uh, my my usage is going to like hundred thousand uh, MAU, right? This is where I think uh, uh, products have to reevaluate. Right? What do you want to focus on? Do you uh, do you want to keep building uh, <clears throat> more and more product features? Uh, so take for example, like this particular platform which we are using, which is a very popular platform. It's called AirMeet. Right? It under under the hood, it is using a uh, uh, a, a SaaS. Right? Uh, should it be building it on their own? And this is what I'm saying. Reevaluate at this point of time. When you have hundred thousand users monthly, uh, at this time you you kind of reevaluate that. What do you want to focus on? Do I want to focus on more adding polls here, some some more features here, or do I think the the, the SaaS is not working out and uh, I will have to rebuild myself, right? And when you reach higher than this, which is like let's say uh, uh, million millions of users. On a monthly basis, now you're getting into the territory of like let's say really big apps. Uh, at that time, it's more of a business, guys. Like at that time, you are optimizing for the unit cost, and whether 
whether that experience works or not right at that time the 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 i mean whatever whatever the reevaluation step you have done previously uh it, it, that is really important for this unit cost and experience to work out otherwise it won't otherwise this business will not work right like you will be spending too much money either or it is not working for those millions of people right so so uh, so sembian i mean uh, i i hope that kind of answers your question uh, that it depends on the scale it does not depend uh, it depends on the stage where you are uh, it, it it this choice is not um uh, um uh, this choice is more about your product stage uh, rather than just 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 making a choice right the the good part is that these choices are uh, reversible right these are not like uh, oh i have burned this choice i cannot change my choice right these choices are uh, reversible what kind of tools are available to automate testing a video platform wow <laughs> shon you want to take a attempt at this first yeah so the really what i see used the most is kite um and what it does is it just launches a bunch of web browsers and will connect to your service and that's kind of like what the um i think i see used the most and then i'm also very interested um there's a couple of projects out there that have looked at like using Python to do load testing because launching an, an entire web browser is super expensive. Um, you know, you have all those cycles to like render and encode and decode. And so um, Oven, Oven Media Engine has like a, a, a tester that uses Python. So, um, so yeah, I would say like go and look at Kite for like your immediate needs. But then, if you find that that's not filling the gap, like you can go look at more of the more of the cutting edge about like with um, WebRTC testing. But like, I would say this is one of like the hardest areas. And then the other one is the um, testing. I see a lot of you can get a lot of value out of testing. More, not so much testing, but observing. WebRTC has really good statistics, and but then the hard part is like understanding what those statistics say. So WebRTC stats will tell you like. Your packet loss and your round trip time and all these really great all this really great data but it's hard to know what it's saying um so yeah that's that's a whole can of worms there huge i think it's another another other a topic for another company or another open source project i mean <laughs> this 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 is a big area in itself um there there are some tools uh, uh but those tools do a point in time job like they, they they do a specific job it is not easy to automate a uh, real world scenario what i suggest or what i have uh, seen work is dog fooding the more do the more dog fooding you uh, do of your own product um, the better you can realize of what are the things you need to automate because automate automation will do uh, like you can automate like say okay I want to, I want to automate this condi condition one condition two condition three condition four right so you can automate these conditions but how do you discover those conditions is just by uh dog fooding your product more and more All right, guys. I think we still have some more time for questions. Uh, I mean, uh... hello. Hey, Samir. Hi. Uh, thanks for the uh, answering the question. And, and uh, uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's, it has been a really great session so far. Uh, so thanks uh, both of you for that and. So I, I I just had a follow up question. So the choice doesn't really limit the kind of uh, feature or product differentiations that you can bring uh, about your product, is it? So for example, you know, uh, Gmail has this uh, like world class noise cancellation, um, you know, uh, feature to it, and uh, each each video platform has its own. Uh, uh, for for example, Microsoft has this uh, you know a virtual meeting room kind of a setup where you can uh, they have this gimmick of 
you can uh, sit next to each other and all these different uh, differentiations that uh, each of them are trying to bring about. And so those are not really limited by uh, the underlying stack decisions. Um, I mean, because the traditional understanding is uh, if you go for a build, you have more uh, control in your hand. You can do a lot of customization uh, versus uh, going for a SaaS uh, platform, which is basically abstracted, uh, you know, the web RPC and uh, the underlying infra. So I was just wondering about that. So, Samir, I mean, uh, I think uh, uh, the, my answer to this question is like all of the things which you are telling, mm -hmm. uh, like virtual backgrounds and those things, those are the things which are possible with SaaS as well as open source, both, right? Those are not possible if you choose a pre-built application. Let's say if you pre use a pre-built Zoom, if you use a pre-built whereby, right? If you use a pre-built, like there are pre-built uh, software which are like embeddable as an iframe. If you use that, then you are kind of, you have the exact feature set as that uh, software has, right? Mm -hmm. But in the, in, the, in the SaaS world, right? Uh, these SDKs, they they do give you the ability. Uh, they do give you the ability to have a raw access to raw audio tracks, raw video tracks. So you can do a mix and match of open source in this also. Um, I understand. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Cool. So another question from uh, Anish, I think uh, if I want to focus on building a Zoom alternative to capture a certain percentage of video conferencing platform, I want to, uh, Anish, you want to come online? Like uh, we can, we can get you here. Uh, this is a very deep question. <laughs> I'm reading it two, three times. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, good morning all. Am I audible? Yes, Anish, you're audible. Yeah, so I was doing a lot of research into this video conferencing platforms and the rise in this post-COVID situation and the market is only supposed to grow as per the reports that I've read. So if um, now Zoom captures like more than 50% of the market share. Now, what I want to mean is if as an entrepreneur, I want to get into this market and capture a certain share uh, that Zoom has, but let's say that people are not satisfied with Zoom, but they are, don't have a better alternative. So what kind of um, uh, client base like should I be targeting? What kind of customers? Like, for example, you could say that um, corporate people shouldn't be there because they have tie-ups with Microsoft Teams and uh, they have their own requirements. So maybe corporate shouldn't be the one we should be targeting. But um, since you guys have been in this industry for so long, maybe you can... Give us an insight. I'll, I'll try and answer uh, uh, Anish, but I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're building a business. A lot of these answers you have to find yourself. But like uh, the straight answer, uh, uh, like my my version of answer here is this, right? Like that. Zoom is now right now. Think of uh, like the way I equate it, as I, I read it in a, on a blog also that Zoom is equal to Craigslist right now, right? Like so, what Craigslist was uh, 20 years back, where uh, you had dating, you had like a job, buying a car, everything was listed as a Craigslist. Uh, and then every section of Craigslist became a kind of a, a billion dollar company. Uh, that is the state of Zoom right now. That Zoom is the baseline tool for, used for everything. Used, for, used by doctors, used by uh, ed tech, used by, used by every industry, right? Uh, if you want to focus, then focus on one cohort basically. You can pick up one cohort saying that, you know what, what if, if I do this better, like, let's say, why are we not doing this call on Zoom? Because AirMeet is giving us something more, right? Similarly, if you want to uh, focus on a target audience, which is not satisfied with Zoom features, uh, would want to do more, that is what you can build. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So one more um, question I have is, um, so I was looking at the all the other uh, alternatives in the market. So uh, the 100 MS I actually got to know before uh, registering for this. Um, so I had been looking at it for some time. And um, so it's listed as an alternative to Agora. But I found there are two more platforms. So Twilio and um, Daily. C, uh, Daily. 
so can you mention like like i found daily to be very similar to what uh, 100 ms is uh, offering so can you enlighten us on the differences or why should we focus on like go for 100 ms instead of daily anish i want to don't want to cover it right now here right like i think that's it um, like we will we'll, we'll share you some material uh, 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 like i don't want to make it this is a kind of a sales webinar right like uh, so we'll we'll share you differences where what is different but at a at a very high level uh, daily gives a pre built kind of uh, sdk while 100 ms is uh, more on the uh, more on the open side of the sdk where you can build everything daily gives you a pre built ui while while 100 ms does not does make no assumptions on ui so that is the biggest difference i would say okay thank you yeah. thank you so much yeah thank you anish anything else guys like we don't get shown so easily so any any deeper questions uh, on webrtc on uh, how, what is the future of webrtc right uh, if not then i will have lots of questions for shon then <laughs> cool i'll ask a question to shon then <laughs> Sean, one of the things which we are really, really uh, struggling and probably one of the hardest problems is uh, network, right? Uh, and I know, I mean, <clears throat> there are certain things which WebRTC still solves. Uh, let's say the NAT traversal and whatnot. But what about congestion, right? Like congestion is probably one of those problems which which happens very often. but the solutions aren't there yet i mean uh, at least nat traversal works right like the congestion solutions um don't even work right now yeah and it's like um the only i think like the most robust widely available so can bandwidth estimation is in libwebrtc and it's very hard to pull out of it and so that's what i'm actively working on right now um and i got a grant from nlnet and we're paying a grad student Mathis Engelbart and he is working actively right now on a bandwidth estimator for pion so basically you'll be able to send video between someone and it'll actually look at um the congestion queues and kind of guess like oh like how much internet is available and it'll look at packet loss and how long like how long does it take to send a packet cuz routers do this really interesting thing where if um it'll you send a packet and then it can't forward it in time it'll put it in a queue and so then it can look and say oh like how long was your packet queued wrong every step so i guess it's another one of those things where there's no simple answer and it's like people are like trying to build stuff on top of these many layers of abstraction so this is this is something i'm actively learning as well um and i'm very very excited about and i'll share a um a github issue in the chat for people that are interested to follow along with this cuz this is like the uh cutting edge of webrtc like it's like as far as i'm aware the only congestion control implementation out there is also in jitsi um all the other sfus and what not like haven't tackled it yet so i'm i'm very excited about this topic and what do you think uh, shawn like the the do you think the congestion control so congestion control has two components one is like again the peer to peer part yeah. right <laughs> then then the business logic part of it also right mm -hmm. like that uh, let's say if there is a let's say we are we are having this conversation right now right so when we were screen sharing it was okay for people to so like somebody has a, has a less less bandwidth uh, prioritize the the screen share versus mm -hmm. not prioritize the others videos right because screen share is probably more important yeah. now do you think this kind of business logic uh, should, should should go in the server uh, in the sfu like where do you think this should be this should be placed basically yeah it's a, it's a hard problem because it's like the server knows how to do the bandwidth estimation because it it knows like the status of the video but it doesn't have like the business logic like it doesn't know there's certain things like like um you know who maybe i've maximized one person's video so like i should like prefer to have that be the higher bandwidth Um, it's definitely a hard problem. It's something that I'm keeping in mind, and like when I'm designing Pion's bandwidth estimator, 
to allow it to give the best decision. Like basically it'll just say like, hey, this is the amount of bit rate that you should be sending and, and giving you Q, like allowing you to make the best decisions. Because um, yeah, I think in a couple of years, like the cut, the state of the state of bandwidth estimation in a couple of years will be so dramatically different than it is now. I mean, even for TCP, like BBR um, had just come out and, you know, you think um, how this field is still so rapidly changing. It's, it's definitely an exciting part and um yeah i don't know i'll be i'll be excited to see where it goes because cool. I'm, I'm definitely yeah, like yeah, following yeah. along yeah. I, I so i i just I, I have one more question actually so i have i had three things one of them is already kind of touched upon but uh one is this uh congestion control the second topic which keeps bothering me or keeps awake uh, like me, me awake in the night is this uh distributed sfu problem yeah. right that you are in us we are in india if people are in US, then and there is an SFU in India, then there is a U loop getting created and whatnot, right? And any thoughts there? I mean, would love to know your thoughts. Where, yeah. where this, where, where will this go? What is the best way to solve these kind of things? Yeah, no, I'm excited about the idea of like having, um, you know, like us on different SFUs effectively. So let's say you know I go into a data center in. New York, you go to a data center in, in India, and then like we connect over the backbone, be it you know AWS, be it Azure, something like that. Like I think there's a lot of advantage there. Um, I'll be excited. Like I think I'm, I'm imagining that some of the big players are already doing this, and they're just not talking about it. But um, it's exciting. I, yeah, that's it's exciting when startups and other companies get involved in the space because they're m much more willing or able to share like what they're doing. Um, so yeah, no, I'm excited to see where that goes. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the way the way I think is like if every stream, uh, if every stream is the ID, basically, um, irrespective of where it is, I mean, uh, you can just like uh, publish and publish to the nearest place and subscribe from the nearest place, basically. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think the third question I had was uh, uh, regarding the scalability of WebRTC CDNs, but I think we already touched upon that. Like. What, when will millions of people be able to <laughs> see things in less than one second? But yeah, I think uh, uh, that we already talked about. Cool. Uh, oh, there are more questions. Okay. Karthik has so many questions. What does insertable streams mean? <laughs> Sean, you should take it. I, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So insertable streams, um, one of the issues with WebRTC is that WebRTC, the video is only encrypted between each hop. So let's say you send your video up to an SFU, the SFU decrypts it and then re-encrypts it and sends it to the user. And so insertable streams basically allows you to do double encryption. So if you scramble your video even before sending it to the SFU. Um, so insertable streams means that you now have end-to-end -end encryption even when you're using an SFU. And then the same um, insertable streams, we now have a sibling API called Breakout Boxes, where I'll be able to actually look at the video frames before they're encoded. So you can do like, you know, um, image recognition and funny hats and stuff like that. Like that's, those are two really exciting APIs that are coming out of WebRTC right now. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the other protocols that I, that everyone's keeping their eye on is web transport. So web transport is this idea that instead of just WebRTC is kind of like the browser does everything for you. Where um, and I shared a link in the chat. Um, where with WebRTC that you exchange a session description and then WebRTC does everything for you. It figures out, like, it measures the bandwidth and says this is how much I should send. Well, a lot of people are of the mindset that WebRTC is too complicated and, like, it's not doing things right. And so um, Web Transport, which is over Quick, is something that people are very interested in. So you have Web Transport and you have Web Codex. Um, and I just watched a really good at um, the IIT RTC, Chris Cunningham just did a really good talk on web codecs. And it's basically, um, you just run the encoder right in the, right in the browser. So you call like 
get user media, and then you literally call encode frame, and then you can send it over WebSocket or Web Transport. Um, and I'll be just interested to see what happens. Like, will this flexibility mean that we get better video products, or will this flexibility mean that we have more bugs because developers write things and don't know all the complexity that goes in? Um, so those, are, yeah, those are kind of the new protocols that are on the horizon, and I, I don't know what's what's going to happen. Um, for me, I, I am very personally invested in WebRTC. You know, I spent so much time working on it, and I really, I, I'm excited because it lets startups and individuals build things quickly, um, and I, I hope it stays that way. So, um, so yeah, that's that's kind of my outlook on, on the next couple of years. Another question, WebRTC is still not that mature. We face the issue on some devices or browser. For example, when pe four people are on call, three people can hear each other, but one person can't hear on three people, maybe only one person. So Amit, this was the thing I was talking about congestion, basically. So there are two problems which can happen here, right? One is, uh, one is an implementation issue or a bug, basically. Like, uh, because each of these streams, uh, it depends if you are kind of, let's say if you're hand, like think about this, WebRTC is P2P, right? So that means the application has to juggle between all of these streams. Uh, and so if there are four people in the conference. That means everybody is handling three downloaded, three download streams and one upload stream, right? Uh, actually more than that, but three, three audio plus video of everybody, right? Um, and now if there are bugs in the implementation, uh, then such a situation can happen, right? That I'm not able to hear somebody and whatnot, right? Other reason could be just uh, congestion. It, it can happen due to congestion, right? There, there is a network problem uh, and, uh, and congestion can cause this, right? Uh, what, I mean, there could be, uh, I think these are the two things which I can think of but it, it can go even deeper but i mean it won't since you are saying uh, other people are able to hear and only one person is not able to hear most probably i would i would go go to these two an application bug uh, or something to do with the network on the receiver end <laughs> what are the other interesting use cases you see in the future in 5 years Okay, I, I don't have to talk five years, guys. I can talk now, basically, right? Like, uh, so so hundreds of use cases, guys. Like, I, I mean, like, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the most interesting ones I've heard of, right? Uh, and the most uh, useful ones, right? Uh, one of the most useful ones I've heard is uh, building uh, something like online uh, schools, right? Um, as of now, most of the video conferencing is appointment based. Like you have an appointment and uh, you go to that exact specified time and you do things at that exact specified time, right? But imagine if it is not entirely appointment based and it becomes more informal. Like imagine me and Sean were available in a, in a, in a kind of a, uh, in a breakout room for, uh, for some more time. We can hang out, right? We can have an after party and whatnot, right? Those are the most more interesting use cases which I'm seeing. So let's say you, you have an online school which has a library in it, which has uh, some breakout rooms where students kind of kind of clear their doubts and whatnot, right? Uh, a similar thing is like an online hospital, an online OPD. Uh, like doctors are really really bad at appointments. <laughs> it is nearly impossible for doctors to to maintain appointments, right? So very very interesting use cases. And most of them related to like, uh, I would say, how you live your life online, right? And uh, maybe Sean can talk about other camera kind of related use cases. Yeah, the, I'm, I'm very excited about the robotics and embedded. Um, I was just working with a company that um, that builds, it's called Format, and they build a basically an SDK for robotics. and one of their customers puts um, robots in the hospitals. And so it'll go and pick up the medicine and go to the patient's room. And that's all over WebRTC. You know, it's, it's remotely controlled via data channels. And then they have another one that's a farming equipment. And you, it goes out and is doing all, this, all these tasks that would be um, 
you know, hard, really hard on people and it takes them out. So I think those ones, um, there's another really cool one, this drone company that they fly these drones over train tracks and they use WebRTC to stream the video back and they use image recognition to say like, are these train tracks damaged? Um, so the robotics one is very interesting to me and secure and like uh, another one is security cameras and surveillance. So you have a lot of these security cameras that are running over RTSP or RTMP, these protocols that have zero encryption. And WebRTC brings a lot of excitement to that space for me because, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of scary. You have hospitals, you have um, government buildings, you have, you know, schools, and that's these are services that are just sitting on the internet. So I'm very excited that WebRTC can bring safety and like privacy to that space. Um, I think those are the two that I've that I've been most passionate about in maybe the past six months. Absolutely. That is that is pretty interesting, Sean. Cool guys, I think I think it is getting super late for Sean. Let's let's yeah. let's uh, let's uh, get him to sleep now uh, so that he can enjoy with his daughter tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, we we would love to have your questions maybe on a like uh, directly reach us out on uh, what do you say LinkedIn right uh, or like uh, you, you, it's not that hard to find us online and we'll be super happy to kind of answer anything else if you have. Yeah no thank thank you so much for everyone attending. I had a, a blast answering your questions and sharing this stuff and uh, please like reach out anytime and and thank you so much for having me. Thank you Sean. Pleasure to have you here. Hey guys, um, thank you so much, uh, Sitesh and Chan, for joining, um, and also every audience who's taking Saturday morning and and spending two hours of time and listening to Shan. And uh, we wish uh, Sitesh a vision that getting Vapor Dizzy as an uh, operating system soon, and also Shan's to get into the five seconds of implementation of Yarn. Um, that's something we are we are we are excited about. And also, maybe guys, you should also check out and we. The open source is the right now era, and you can see a lot more uh, innovation through collaboration in, in, in open source itself. So we all wish um, them, and also feel free to contribute to Poundly and check, uh, check out um, Chan's work.